Mort is a weakling, wimpy, limp, and freaking shit. How dare he do what he has done? I'll relay his crimes in a format as synonymous, for I am anonymous and mimic Mort the ominous. Now, he's out of his mind, but the other Morts are not. His genetic code is shot like the grandmother he fought, buried her in a well, and hell if he ain't a malicious and delicious little eldritch entity Lovecraft sent to me on the silver platter lined with horrific insanity. He deserves as few videos as possible. Unfortunately, I've succumbed to DreamWorks and their awful show. What the hell is wrong with me? Am I free? Even lost in the lore? Maybe. I mean, I'm on video four. He gets what he deserves, nothing less and nothing more, which is one measly attempt at countering this it ain't glorious, but as expected with the worst lemur, sacrificial lists identify him as their first lemur. Hell or high water, I will rip apart this night creature as his war crimes span the planet in this double feature roast. More is fishy in his genes, are we surprised as it seems? He's an alien from deep space with a feet taste, sitting, eating Cheetos and Doritos and his dipping chips slouching in-house on couch, throwing shade like an eclipse. Everyone, you are now on part four of my theory on Mort from Madagascar. Make sure to click the link above now, which will allow you to see the videos as a playlist I've made, as intended. Technically, again, this is part two, section three, but for the algorithm, part four. For those who are prepared for the rest of All Hail King Julian, it is time. We are nearing the end of exile. And here we are, at probably the best episode in the whole series. One of the best animated kids TV episodes in recent and inexperienced memory. Carl claims to be responsible for Koto's conquest, but that's questionable. Julian blows up on another mine and appears back in limbo. The pineapple claims that this is, in fact, Frank Rilla. Otherwise, what the lemurs know as the heaven of the sky gods. They tease if this is still all in Julian's unconscious mind, but we saw Clover's grandma unrelated to Julian. We know better. The fruits hold a divine trial and bring in all of the dead characters to testify against Julian. Someone's also there as a recurring joke who's actually still just alive. The fruits and veggies are focused on Madagascar as if it's the center of the universe. They are its gods. Julian returns to life eventually and no time has passed, like some sort of heaven time dilation. Meanwhile, Maurice has been kidnapped by the underground bell gods. Turns out the bells are actually just snails in disguise who are terrified of the surface due to French cuisine. Apparently they have a worldwide network of underground tunnels and their leader is named Jingle Jangle. Maurice is the chosen one, but the bells he repeatedly forsakes until they manipulate him and then he doesn't. But the most important plot of this episode is of course Mort, who has returned to the Mortverse. Morticus claims to have been waiting 1,000 years for his battle with Mort, implying either time dilation or Mort's true age. He claims he's been searching since their last encounter, and that both he and Mort are immortal, multiversal conquerors. Mort has forgotten all of this somehow, and he asks if he missed the first act. Fourth wall break! Apparently, Morticus wants to absorb Mort? just like Mort absorbed countless versions of himself from the countless universes, but forgot due to the consequences of interdimensional travel. These are the personas in his mind. Brilliant. It makes him bloated though, apparently. Morticus mutilates the mom bot and claims there can only be one leader of the Mortverse. Morticus owns Mort in the most obscene ways possible. They enter the ring and a wigged female Mort holds up the round signs. The Mort horde whistles in sensual approval. Morticus sniffs Mort creepily and claims to smell his soul. Morticus wants Mort's endless absorbed spirits for himself and Mort retaliates by showing a picture of the foot constellation to entrance him. It's super ineffective. The feet are the only restraint on these otherwise anomalous immortal entities, and Mordecus overcame it. He eats the diagram. Mordecus threatens Julian's feet, enraging Mort while the army chants. Mort eats some dirt and vomits, slamming Mordecus into the portal machine, electrifying him to death, and funneling his spirit into Mort. 
I do believe Mort has now absorbed everyone Mordecus had inside of him. All of the multiverse Morts he absorbed. The portal breaks. Chapter 11 is equally absurd, to be honest, you'll see. Julian starts it off by highlighting how he misses the usual simple standalone stories. Mort bangs his head and it sounds like metal. Mort is aware of this madness. He calls the whole plotline, quote, totally freaking insane. Do you know what else? Every single character in this show is implied to be Jewish and bisexual. It's a very specific sort of universe. Sage Astral projects in a way that allows him to physically interact. Now without coffee, Timo uses the mom bot to hypnotize Mort with a laser, sending him into his subconscious where he can manually find smart Mort to fix the portal home. The first thing Mort observes when he enters his mind is that it's dark in here. You and me both, Mort. In various rooms of this haunted mansion of a mind, we see a trampoline Mort, a trike Mort, twin Morts in diapers from The Shining, a Mort that crawls on the ceiling and cranks its head 180 degrees before threatening to eat him, so on. I think this is an owl-spider-Mort hybrid. I don't know. There's also a Spanish Mort and the Mort from when he was in that butterfly costume. I don't know what is what, that'll be for my actual theory videos on this topic. They all stalk him down the halls. He is chased by his own actions while terrifying circus music blares in the background. My question is, how far and wide has Mort been? This is quite a sophisticated human structure, a foot mansion. Maybe it's a good thing he's forgetful. Then his granny shows up. Just as Mort finds Smart Mort tied up, Smart Mort says, The spider has ensnared the fly. As his grandmother enters the picture, her plan is to escape the creepy mind prison, take control of Mort's body, and replace him. I wonder where Mordecus is hiding in here. Clearly the granny's been here some time because she's mastered the arts of mental competence when she levitates and slams the door on Mort. Smart Mort seems capable of anything, but it's Mort who tries using his quote big thing to will open the door and does. Then granny comes in with a spiked ball and chain containing a mine on the end. Mort changes it, and his grandmother accuses him of voodoo, which leads to the most epic Matrix parody anti-gravity inception battle I've ever seen. Mort says the only one who gets to do weird stuff in his brain is him. They punch each other, changing gravity, as the granny rallies up dozens of other Morts to destroy him. Mort vomits a beam of pure light and seemingly annihilates all of the other spirits before repurposing the mansion as a field in the Alps. They battle like two titans across a stormy sky before the granny calls him out for consuming her essence and she tries melting him with x-ray vision. Mort spawns a deep wishing well and traps the cursed night creature at the bottom. With Smart Mort saved, the portal is fixed, and they escape with the Mort Horde. Despite now knowing what he is, Timo cries when he thinks Mort has died, calling him just the child. Um, no, certainly not. Exiled Finale, Part 1. Clover astral projects and goes to space with the Mentor, only to suddenly appear in similar Alps to Mort's mind, where she meets a butterfly that I theorize is the inner soul of Sage's hawk, or not. She finds Sage's soul, and together, they possess his body and save Julian's life by destroying the execution machine. They expend massive levels of soul energy and punch Kodo with the power of ripping space-time. It's not enough. Then Carl reveals he has the most elaborate backup plan in known history when he reveals he built a space station which eclipses the sun and charges a laser to fry all of the mountain lemurs, it crashes into the moon and blows up. Then the Russian monkeys return. They crash into a volcano due to the oligarch dolphins. Then Mort shows up. Thousands of the horde rain from the sky portal and consume the enemy, while Maurice and his army of bell snails come from beneath and corner the mountain lemurs on all fronts. Turns out this was the war foretold by the leader of the bells. If you were to enter the show without seeing any episodes here, you'd wish for the end of humanity. No writer sane or insane, should conjure such ideas. Todd seemingly cannibalizes the mountain lemurs when his mom screams to go after their jugulars. The thousand morts are shot from crossbows and explode on impact. Sage drills down by meditating. The bell snails get Maurice to fart and summon the great jingle jangle through a portal from who knows where. He arrives and he's like a hundred feet tall or something. He gets hit with a tiny bit of salt and shrivels up completely. Wow. You know, I'm also shocked at how much Maurice hates Julian in the films. What happens between them, if anything? 
Kodo nearly kills Julian, but Mort redirects the spear and pierces someone else's butt cheek. It is now the second half of Exiled's finale. Archaic war commentary abounds. Pineapple literally narrates it. He calls it the Battle of Booty Ridge. The soundtrack's been killer these past few episodes, and all the other kingdoms bow to Julian, and Mort claims without the feat his life would be twice as meaningless as it already is. Tammy snaps picks as Todd mulls the enemy some more. The tentacle comes back and kicks butt with his baseball dad, who appears from a portal in the sky spontaneously. They defeat Kodo, but he returns on a hawk and kidnaps Julian. Sage and he have a sky battle in which they hella bitch slap each other and crash from hundreds hundreds of feet in the sky. Sage spares him, but Julian accidentally topples his statue and it crushes him to death. They blame Maurice. Mort goes for the feet, thinking, quote, This time will be different! Spoiler alert, it's not. Dude gets punted into next Tuesday. Gigi hooks up with the tentacle's dad. Clover and Sage nearly kiss, teasing an epic romance soon to be in a kid's show, but then they flat out zoom up and show Mort is making out with Zora right above them, aggressively, intimately. They married. All of the Heaven Ghosts show up and wave, like at the end of Star Wars Episode 6, except Kodo appears like Anakin, and he didn't redeem himself. And I haven't seen the Star Wars films. Everyone is happy, goes their separate ways, the Horde goes off to live on an island, the Russians cause an incident with their warhead. Julian humps the throne, and Mort calls it, quote, one lucky chair. Exit stage exiled, onto the final season. Final season premiere. Mort gets kicked over yonder and claims he don't want to die this way. If he remembers any fragment of his full life, maybe then he can be killed, not just absorbed by similars? This episode thrusts one truth in our faces hard. The Sky Gods aren't hiding anymore. A huge 2D hand reaches from the heavens and gives Julian a keyboard infused with energy. Oh, oh, wait. Never mind, that Julian's just dreaming. But would you honestly blame me for presuming otherwise? This also means Mort's statement about death is dubious. When Julian awakens, Mort relishes over him per the usual and then lambasts Maurice for getting snail mucus on everything. Mort requests a technical toenail garden. I don't know what the hell that means. Mort has some feminine oviparity in his genome too, it would seem, as Zora demands that they reproduce, and he says he hasn't laid an egg in 40 years, and it hatched an abomination. Part bird. Tammy claims her son is woke. Sage spoons his hawk. The second we get back to this episodic format, there's loads of social satire again. This time about criticism, safe spaces, forced positivity, and participation awards. A lemur screams at a cantaloupe, What do you want from me? I wonder if it's a heaven fruit. Alien music does play. Todd nearly dies again. Then I'm pretty sure he eats like half the population again. Mort advertises to children how he will support you if you rub his belly and it'll cost ya. Purely disturbed. Julian feigns an NDE, and Mort cries, then snaps on some gloves, wiggles his fingers, and thirsts, as they say. Episode 2. They break the fourth wall by mocking a flashback. Propaganda commentary that devolves into insanity. Mort and Zora get freaky, if they weren't already. It was only a matter of time before they pulled a radioactivity joke on Mort, and here it is. He swims in a toxic watering hole and then glows green. He calls everyone neurotic, and then his teeth fall out. He then hops in a densely toxic pool, and poisonous gas explodes from his orifices as he vomits brown tar before bubbling, transmutating into popcorn, and screaming his skin off. He calls everyone overreactive as a skeleton, proving once again and for all that he has some bone structure. Maurice is an ancient aliens conspiracy theorist. Same. Episode 3. Julian has a nightmare about Todd being snatched by a monster. Apparently, it was somehow real. Tammy scared it off, but Todd was not left unscathed. Everyone automatically assumes Mort was the monster because, well, you know why at this point. He sits in the corner of a creepy cave and says, <laughs> Not me! with his granny's wig on. At this point, he's just embracing what he is, considering we know his granny is currently trapped down in the mind well. Todd's dad calls him, quote, a delusional little girl who sadly must be put down. Butterfish is his dad's name, and he is 
indescribably dumb in the best possible way. Everyone keeps accusing Mort of being a horrific and murderous night creature, and he even admits to having been cursed many, many times. Julian's parents show up and admit they single-handedly repopulated the kingdom, answering the inbreeding questions from much earlier, and also why everyone claims to be cousins in this show. His parents also then shatter the fourth wall when they criticize Julian for battling Kodo an entire season. Uncle King Julian walks in and calls his sister Babe. Now they're just plain R-rated. LMFAO ho. We finally get a new, truly unique moment from Mort when he reveals something we didn't know yet. His descendants. He says to let Julian cry it all out as it works on his grandchildren. Instead of leaving it as an offhand comment, Maurice once again asks Mort to elaborate, to which Mort immediately forgets he even mentioned them, and panics, asking, How did they escape? Don't let them find me! He then shoots a spider web and confirms he is indeed part spider as he hides on the ceiling. Clearly, whatever eggs he's hatched weren't just random things. They were characters who I'd like to meet, actually, and paired with his previous statement about dead butterflies, I bet they're spider babies. Julian keeps having dreams within dreams. This episode is packed, my god. I expected less after the jaw-dropper that was exiled, but nah. Turns out the lemur werewolf beast is Julian, surprise, surprise. It attacks a couple watching The Shining in which Mort is the twin girls like we saw in his mind, and Todd is Danny. They filmed this. Everyone keeps thinking Todd died, and his dad doesn't even recognize him, calling him a random little girl again. Later calls him his stepdaughter. A statue seemingly blinks. I don't know how much longer I can ramble off the, the unexplained supernaturality of this show. Oh, well, we're almost done. Mort breaks into a creepy situation just to say, tick, tock, tick, tock. Mort promiscuously dances in a cage at a night party and says, Hey, boys! Even Julian's parents are appalled. Text superimposes itself in a spatially 4D manner, nobody questions it, as it is post-productive editing. I'm seriously losing it here. Apparently Julian's transformation is just a really bad milk allergy. Okay. Episode 4. Todd's dead eyes are brought up. Maurice gets money for dancing, and even admits that the only reason he's loved by anyone is for his thick booty. Which Julian promptly slaps. What? They show Maurice a picture of a hyper-realistic cat, so he'll cry and overload a robot's emotional apperception. This episode has a whack timeline, and Mort claims to have been trapped in a pie for years. Then he dives into a volcano in the name of Julian. This whole episode was a story Julian made up, but again, like all Madagascar metafictions, it could all be true and no eyes would nor should be batted. But then at the last second, Mort reveals he's a robot. A joke, a thriller cliffhanger. Episode 5. Mort sniffs a new chick, and Julian hires Todd to be the cool kid in his entourage. Tammy cries, Butterfish eats his fingers. Julian claims Todd is three days old. Julian is not like Mort, Julian is hyperbolic. Therefore, Todd is most likely not three days old. Mort is fired for the sake of Todd's position, and Mort screams bloody ageists as he's evicted from the room. Todd is in danger. Mort goes off the deep end of villainy, and Zora's still all like, huh? You see, Mort takes advantage of Tammy's anguish and steals Todd's identity. Social media and statistical commentary this episode intersperse with overt jokes. Mort's baby identity is sort of back, but this time he's pure malice. And indeed, here we get confirmation that all of Mort's alters are still alive and well, even after he light vomited on them. Todd briefly comes home to grab his toothbrush, and we get probably the most 180 degree scene from the sorts of things Mort does in the films. People who haven't seen this show still think Mort is a helpless little baby. Show them this. Mort mimics Todd to a T and then evilly growls, You made your bed, loser, and I'm laying in it. Mort holds Todd's family hostage with the sheer grit and uncanny horror of Tammy knowing something's wrong with her son, but being too terrified to act upon that pit in her stomach. Mort is exploiting this devastated fear Tammy has, and it is high-octane nightmare fuel. He seduces Tammy and brushes her with his tail. And the scary part of this is that Mort is intentionally honing the creepiness he's absorbed from his immortal lifespan. Todd says, Come at me, bro! And Mort threatens to rip off his face. 
Ah, you know, this episode has this kingdom thief lady, and I immediately thought it was that con woman from a few seasons ago. Turns out, it was true. See? You learn how to predict the unpredictable after a while of enduring this. It conditions you! Episode 6. Julian slaps Butterfish and he giggles like a geisha for some what the f out of character reason. Julian releases tea to the world like he did coffee so long ago, and Mort uproots everyone in the line, downs the whole drink, and then chomps the ceramic cup down as well. We know what coffee does to him, so what does tea do? Well, he screams in pain and then jets up with 60s glasses and an absolute hippie demeanor. He wears a flower necklace and leads a cult, all what with his Am I okay? Can I be reduced to two letters? And his Society programs us like a robot escaping the mannequin factory. This would be mythical and shocking, but we know exactly what is happening here. It's just one of the absorbed souls being metabolically triggered, like Smart Mort. They plan to tranquilize Mort if he gets even an ounce weirder. Honestly, at this point, the writers could do anything with Mort, and I'd accept it. So let's just go with the assumption that literally anything can happen to him. An infinitely variable Schrodinger scenario. Carl appears in Julian's bed and says that he has a proposition for him. The characters in this show are apparently endless, as Carl's brother then enters the picture as a bully who befriends the Russian dolphin jocks. <sighs> But Carl's brother does teach Julian about human culture, which is something he also needed knowledge of ever since learning of their existence in order to make him the character we know in film, and more importantly, in the other spin-off. Corporate and drug commentary. The tea is banned. Mort resorts to coffee, thus bringing out you-know-who. Clover pretends to be an international businessman with a mustache, and Carl's brother says, Big Daddy likes a solid seven chick with a nice bushy flavor saver under her nose. What? What? What is this show? What is this show? Mort acts as a distraction during a heist by posing as a mermaid. Are we surprised? No. He's wearing the granny wig. Carl takes credit for another manipulation. Shocker. Episode 7. Julian threatens to harm Mort, which Mort loves the idea of. Timo's robot censors Timo and says, There could be children watching. The ever-increasing fourth wall breaks aren't what get me, though. It's that she said there could be children watching, which means it's not the target audience. It all makes sense now. Mort downs a bunch of luminescent goop. Mort might be part plant. Mort sleeps in Zora's fat rolls. Mort approaches Julian and says, quote, he alters his DNA. Everyone thinks Maurice is dead, and Mort's first words are dibs on his hut. Pineapple breaks the fourth wall as a huge mango grows and starts talking. Maurice hates Julian for blame shifting. Mort beats up the jumbo mango. Two crocodiles fall on each other and say, Let my body be your pillow. Mort knows how cell phones work. The intelligent mango absorbs everyone's minds and heads for the mainland, so Timo calls the supply company of the luminescent goop that created it, and they immediately nuke it in the middle of the ocean. Episode 8, Mort says he's the smartest lemur in the world, which we know is true in many ways. We know sky gods are real in Madagascar, but apparently their lore entails Julian I as being the first lemur, who demanded the gods create more. This lore was structured by King Julian the Terrible, so take it all with a grain of salt. They flip through this book of lore, and Mort finds his page. He's in the history section as Adam, and a female Mort next to him is Eve. Clearly this book is all whacked. It has to be. Because Granny Mort was his grandma. Unless she was just another multiverse version of Mort who took on the role as his grandma. Still not clear on how he absorbs species from any universe or just variants of himself, I don't know. But this book is messed. Julian too is terrified and asks how freaking old Mort truly is. Answer. If Mort was an interdimensional conqueror in some forgotten lifetime, similarly to Mordecai Khan, and he remembered his granny from 50 years ago, but couldn't remember absorbing her, and perhaps his life as a pirate, then how old? His timeline is all over the place, but let's just assume that he's thousands or millions of years old. He's a Goodman's mouse lemur on the outside, but inside he's added some genome elements. Mouse lemurs evolved 9 million years ago, so there's our limit considering his basis and alleged role as the atom of his species. No wonder he has a self-erasing memory. Infinite lifetime. Education system commentary. Todd is a child prodigy with a photographic memory. Mort wants to be a trophy wife for Julian and has his name engraved on him. 
Todd has PTSD and lives in crippling fear of his mother's screams. Mort poses as Todd in an academic competition, and Smart Mort takes the reins from the inside of his subconscious, or at least he tries to, but is convinced by the other spirits to do otherwise. Todd's demon comes out again when his head cranks 180 degrees and he mauls his kidnapper. Episode 9, they hold an election for a small ranking position in the kingdom and Mort is supposed to fail on purpose. Well, the show literally plays a scare chord as it zooms into Mort's head and shows that there is a whole council of political Morts inside of his mind mansion. The most extremist one, responsible for previously nuking something, locks the others up and takes control of Mort's body. We finally see this possession process. Political Mort then steals the election by hiding in Zora's she-mountain pouch, and saying cunningly persuasive things like, You need the Mort. You want the Mort inside you, whispering, Mort. Political Mort uses persuasion tactics like saying his opponent, Maurice, is in bed with the Fusa, and doesn't believe in the Sky Gods. Commentary. Everyone starts to love this Mort, so he tests their faith by blabbering gibberish on stage, and sure enough, they consider it genius somehow. He does this for ten days in a row. They're voting for the position of Mango Manager or something, and while everyone watches Mort do a toilet dance, fruit flies eat all of the fruit and kidnap the kingdom to lay their larva. The other spirits break free and subdue political Mort before sending Chainsaw Mort into Mort's mental control room to saw himself free of the fruit flies. Maurice farts to kill the flies and the subtitles read sustained flatulence. Very few children will watch the subtitles, but I do, and whomever writes these knows what's up. Mort later vomits up thousands of dead flies and then becomes a giant one and flies away. Now he's part fly. Eating mass quantities alters his genome. That's how. Mort is Kirby. Also explains the black hole that is his stomach. I'll go in more detail later, but I'm almost certain that Mort, yeah, is like Kirby and has a pocket dimension inside of him. Episode 10. Carl and his bug move to Florida, but not before setting up a Willy Wonka tour of his lair to have someone replace him as, quote, the great evil. Meanwhile, Mort's grandpa shows up, and Mort remembers him from when he and his siblings were babies celebrating Hanukkah. See? Mort may be the OG, but he isn't the oldest. I don't even know how that works, but it does. This is Grammy's hubby, too. He's a convict. Once in Carl's tour, they even parody Wonka's subtle creepiness, just like I always do. Grandpa Mort was imprisoned, and Mort responds by describing how his voices get mad when he can't remember committing terrible crimes. Grandpa Mort implies all Morts are meant to be incredible forces of evil. Mort says he constantly has near-fatal levels of water retention. Regardless, Mort drinks an ocean and barfs up a billionth of a percent of it later on. His stomach is the pocket dimension mansion. Grandpa Mort says as evils in their family's blood, which is why they inhale essences. Clearly Mort forgot all of this as a coping mechanism to evade villainy, which reminds me of ABC's Fringe. Apparently, it was King Julian IV who locked Mort's grandpa away, and our Julian, Seven Greats' grandson the 13th, is going to pay for it. Mort is a wild collective soul jar soup, and his grandpa wants to enter the absorption too. He begs for Mort's evil, and when it's denied, he absorbs Mort himself. Mort is apparently too powerful and stupid at this point, and it blows his grandpa up. Mort nearly dies in the process, and Julian yet again screams, He's just a child! as he punches Mort a la bootleg CPR. Carl enters, and Julian sighs, We've already reached the climax. Mort keeps dying and resurrecting, and I'd like to see what the hell is happening from his mansion's perspective. Carl reveals it was all a setup, and then pulls out Moon Laser 2.0 to wipe Madagascar off the map, but Julian was always prepared to take advantage of Carl's laser obsession, and finally defeats him. More Maurice emotion mockery. Episode 11, Mort swallows a mine whole and blows up. The whole security system just so happens to land on the beach. Clearly a trap, but this is normal for the show too. Surveillance commentary ensues. Todd is arrested for a fashion faux pas. Prison commentary ensues. The episode is a musical. More Willy Wonka parodies. An episode too late. Someone watched it the night before and it influenced their screenwriting, I swear. Mort is back on them ancient aliens. The whole kingdom is imprisoned. Tammy is the boss around these parts if you know what I mean. Mort is verbally stated to be virtually indestructible. Apparently Mort never writes anything down because it can be used against him in court. Someone's been writing letters to Zora in prison and it turns out to be Julian's uncle again, who's also behind the surveillance trap. He's fallen in love with Zora though. Uncle Julian says he's spent so many seasons searching and finally he found true love. How does Mort, you know, her husband, react to this? He straight don't give a shit. He's all like, dodge that bullet. Oh, the savagery. And so here we are, series finale, 
part one. This episode is called The End Is Near, and part two is called The End Is Here. Fourth Wall! Clover's gonna marry Sage, and Maurice says five seasons of romantic tension is more than enough. First, Mort gives marriage advice, he then suggests they lock Clover away until she forgets him. Clover's grandma, the one that proved the supernatural exists in this show, speaks to Clover from the Sky God Heaven when Sage marries Crimson instead. Clover undoes this and takes him for herself. They once again mock how Exiled was a season long. Mort suddenly reveals another new ability, which is apparently partial consciousness transference. He calls Hector an old man again, this time without speaking, and Hector hears him. Mort can read and write minds, which we've seen before. Must be a consequence of spiritual proprioception. Episode 13, the final episode, part two, whatever you want to call it, is the end. Oh, thank God. It's been weeks, months from my perspective, only an hour and a half for you guys. Mort keeps dozens of tombstones on standby in his house. He also claims he himself has been in jail for a large amount of time in the past. He has moments where he remembers and then doesn't question why he forgets later. Gigi says she hasn't seen many of the guests at Clover's wedding in multiple seasons. Get your fourth wall headass asses out of here. There's a banana meme lord. Heaven fruit guarantee. And you know what Mort's last words are in this show? I hope Clover and Sage last longer than my 12 marriages. Of course, most of my wives died of old age. We end where we began. Every character that ever died is partying with the fruits up in heaven, and then Alex the lion washes up in his box on the beach. Surprisingly, before my theories, my only question now is, does Mort include Zora or Pam in that wife count? He never formally divorced Zora or was ever legally married to Pam, but we know he has kids and grandkids, so does it really matter? We never met his parents either, absorbed guarantee. There is more, such as tying it into grander theories, but I did already get some of the big ideas I have out here. I'll recap them and discuss them and assimilate them later, of course. But before we do that, we still have to do Pell the Penguins of Madagascar, which is going to be almost as long. Give me a month or something like a break. I need to do other theories. My god, I feel so bad for the people who don't actually want to watch these Mort theories. The Bee Movie and Kung Fu Panda can also tie in here with animal intelligence, and that'll be later. Loose Thoughts. Morticus sounds like Mort's home planet, Footicus. And if Mort really is metallic inside, it makes sense why he bawled in film one when Maurice said the zoo gang was there for their precious metals. I'll discuss this more in the theory too, but in Madagascar 3, maybe Mort is implying a little more when he says, My tummy is speaking to me! Kirby headass. For now, subscribe. Part 2 has rapidly, as you can see, become parts 3 and 4 as well, bumping us up to a 17-part series now. If this keeps happening, again, this is why I estimated a total of 25 parts. Who knows what the future holds in regards to the next videos. I'm sure my evidence delve into the Penguins TV show will take a couple of videos, but I foresee it being an easier task somehow. It will be next, whenever it will be. Make sure to subscribe so you don't miss the next leg of this Mort theory, because once we finish all this evidence, we get to the answers not provided, the truth of where he's from and what he is. A unifying theory of Mort, because everything can fit together into one massive story. And once we solve Mort, then we get to the next chunk of this 25-part behemoth. We move on to the next film, and we create our DreamWorks timeline centered around Mort the Lemur. Follow my Twitter at TheTheorizerYT and turn on notifications here while you watch my other animated theories in the meantime. Those ones are mind-blowing. This has just been an evidence delve. I haven't actually done any critical thinking yet. I don't know why you guys love this so much. And until then, everybody, I'm exhausted, but still the theorizer. Mort is stupid, I am not. Bootleg SCP ass thought. Take him down, get him gone. Backhand him like Morty Khan. Peasants don't get presents, they get roasted like a pheasant. Madagascar's worse with this curse remaining alive and perverse. Evil, rotten, horrifying. Intel lacking, mortifying. Piece of sh anomaly. I will prove it, you will see.